What, what, what did we talk about? We started talking about. Okay. Well, the general optimist, okay. Uh, what did we say was the form of the general optimization problem? We're talking about minimizing some function at fix. It's selected from RN. And what is this called? You know, what is this called? Yeah. Well, object to function. And then this would be the unconstrained optimization problem where you are searching over all possible. Okay. But what about constraint? Subject to? Yes. Zero. Zero. And what is this called? What are these two called? These are the. Inequality and strings, and these are okay. Oh, yes, okay. And then, well, we saw some examples of uh, these, and then we started talking about some uh, from from mathematical preliminary. So we talked about sequences, and we talked about the limit of a convergent sequence, okay, and then. Alternative. When is the function f of from R? This is from when is this continuous? Yeah, this function is continuous at x naught. When is it continuous at x naught? What is the condition for this function f of x to be continuous at x naught? Okay. Okay, exists. Okay, there is there is a finite value. Okay. Well, if this is if you're talking about function from R two to R, we are talking about continuity at x naught. If you approach this x naught in any direction, from any direction, through a sequence of uh, positions, okay, and let's let's say we call those call that sequence x one, x two, x three, x k, such that the, the limit of this sequence is x naught. If this this sequence of positions in R two are approaching x naught, and the corresponding function values of each of these that's another sequence of real numbers, and if the limit of um, This, if the lim if the limit of this sequence is f of x naught, that's what I've written here. The limit of f of x when x approaches x naught, and what that means in terms of what we know about, we always talk about limits of a sequence. What this means is, if you take a bunch of x's, a sequence of x that whose limit is x naught, and the corresponding function values, if the limit of this sequence of numbers is f of x naught, then you say the function is continuous at x naught. This applies also for functions from R to R. This is a general notion. Okay. 
Then? The friendship will be. Again, it talks about F. When is F differentiable at X naught? Well, we'll first talk about our door. This is finite. And uh, and let's say we call this Px or Dixon. Okay. And the limit this delta x tending to zero minus this term should be equal to it doesn't matter from which direction you approach, this approach is zero the two of them should be equal and that should be equal to this okay. and then and then we talked about differentiability of f and when is this different show at x not now what of it okay if all in derivatives exist And the list of n partial derivatives, we can, there are n of those. That means if you collect them together uh, in the form of a column vector, n belongs to Rn. This is called, well, at x naught, this will be. And we said we said we'll follow this convention that you can talk about taking the gradient of uh, a function from R n to n. If you take it with respect to a row vector, then you get a column. If you take it with respect to a column vector, then you get a row. Okay. Yes. Yes. Sorry. Yes. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. For, so here, it's the same formula. Well, here just the sign is different here, right? If you're saying you, you're approaching from here, from minus, that means the sequence of values corresponding to. So when you say this tends to zero, right? You're really talking about a sequence of numbers like this. Each of these tends to zero, and if you say zero minus, that means these are all negative values, but each one of them is progressively getting closer to uh, zero. The um, expression is the same, you don't have to change it. Okay? Because if you change it like this, right, that's equivalent to this. Then you're saying both both of these correspond to approaching it from the right side, right? For example, if this was also x naught plus delta of x minus f of x naught plus x, if you do this, these are all positive x's, these are all negative x's. Then it's the same. And in fact, will that even be correct? For example, here, uh, if you put minus here, right? I mean, it, it, this won't be equal. In fact. If you put minus here and delta x's are all negative numbers, if you put plus here and delta x are all positive numbers, let's say the sequence is the same except that the other sequence is this. 
both of these would be the same, but the denominators would have different signs. See, the backward difference, see, whether you say, okay, you say forward difference is this. Okay. I'll say this is also backward difference. If I do this now, well, this, this the sign of this also has to change. Otherwise, you'd, uh, you'd, you'd get the opposite sign for your derivative. All right. And then, what did we talk about? Okay. This is simply a n cross n matrix that's symmetric uh, yeah, and symmetric. And this is the matrix of second order derivatives of f x with respect to x, well, x1, x2, xn. So, what will be the ijth element of, so if you're talking about the ijth element, yep, so this will be, because it's symmetric, ij and j, ji will be the same, okay. Right. Okay, this is where we stopped. Okay. We, oh, yes, we talked about level sets. That's right. What are level sets? Yeah. So the level set for a function f of x are two. See, it's simply the set of all x's for which. Okay, and then we talked about what what would be the level set for. Let's say we're talking about uh, vectors from R two. Then there's the beans. What about this? And also, what would be the levels? I mean, this is a function from R2 to R, so it's of this form. What will be the level set for C equals 1? Okay. 2, you just see this. So these are all the level sets. What about this? Yeah, so this will simply be. This would be level set for 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 4. So, this is another way of visualizing uh, a function from R2 to R, uh, where the level sets tell you the value taken by that function on that curve. Okay. So, uh, this function uh, would essentially then look like a cone. This would be also a cone, but except that it's a it's a square cone. This will also be a square cone. This is a rotated square cone. That's just a square cone. Okay. Okay. So the next uh, useful idea, uh, especially in continuous optimization. Is see before we get to this, uh, we should talk about another theorem, uh, which is called the mean value theorem. Does anybody, anybody remember this? What is this? Well, maybe if I draw the picture, maybe you'll remember. Let's say you have a function like this. Say we, we have a continuous function and it's continuously differentiable. It's differentiable everywhere, right? Say we have a point x, x naught, then we have a point x, okay? And let epsilon equals 
x minus x now that's this gap the value that the function takes here is f of x naught value that the function takes here is f of x and this is the secant connecting it do you remember the mean value theorem yep f of c yeah? what is c right okay you'll have to switch a b c with x naught x okay okay switch a and b with x naught and x okay okay all right okay okay equal to what that's the important thing well it will be a constant because these are all constant when well this is epsilon okay this is correct but this will be equal to f dash f dash means the first derivative of it's not f of dash f dash at x naught but it will be something a little strange we change this okay where theta is a number between 0 and 1 okay what that means is if you have a, a curve like this and you know the function's value at x naught and another value at x okay another way to write this let me just re re rewrite this f of x equals f of x naught uh, plus f dash of x naught plus theta sigma into epsilon. Okay. What this means is the value at f of x is the sum of value. You start with f of x naught, and then if you compute this slope okay uh, and multiply it by epsilon you'll get f of x okay but it turns out the mean value theorem tells you so if you have two points like this there is always a point in the middle where the slope of the curve is exactly equal to the slope of the secant so there is a point somewhere here that's what essentially the uh, mean value theorem tells you that there is a point somewhere in between these two where the slope of the curve is exactly equal to this the slope of this line joining these two points okay and that point is in between x naught and x okay which is a simply expressed and let's say that's some point here x bar x bar is less than or equal to x naught sorry let us say uh, x n where is it not equal to x naught or another way to write this is x bar equals x naught plus theta times epsilon, where theta is a number between 0 and 1. These two are equivalent statements. Okay. Epsilon is the difference between these two. Theta is a number between 0 and 1. That means this can never be greater than x because theta is a number between 0 and 1. This can never be lower than x naught. Okay. But Maybe this is difficult to remember, but the, the picture is this. If you have a curve like this, this is the slope of the line joining these two points. This is maybe this is these you remember a points a and b, f of a, f of b. What this tells you is there is a point somewhere in between these two points where the slope of the line is exactly equal to the slope of this. That's what the statement says. Okay. That's the mean value theorem. The Taylor's theorem is, in a way, a, a generalization of this. It says if you have a function, let's say we are talking about functions from R to R. Okay? And let's say this function is differentiable m times. m derivatives exist. Okay? The Taylor's theorem says that if you have a, uh, a function, continuous function that is whose derivatives, whose m derivatives exist over some interval, okay, then 
this func the function f of x can be expressed as an mth order polynomial. Okay. If you know, uh, shall I remove this? Okay. Okay. Let's say we okay. It's you've got m derivatives. Let's say we know uh, we start with a point, some point x naught, and we know the value of the function at this point, and we know all of its derivatives at that point. No, what I'll do to reduce the amount of writing, I will simply use this notation. Three means that I'm this is the third derivative of f at x naught, okay. And we know this. I will let's say we know this, okay. <laughs> if you have a function for which you know this at some point x naught. Then the theorem tells you that you can, for some x, okay, which is x naught plus some real number epsilon, okay, positive or negative real number, f of x can be written as as the nth order polynomial. It's not f dash of x naught epsilon. Just like the Taylor series, but you truncated x naught into epsilon square. That's simply uh, x minus epsilon, uh, x minus x naught. Okay. And then 1 by 3 factorial. Epsilon cube. And then. one and then the final term will be the nth derivative but not at x naught at some point x naught plus theta times epsilon okay. this is simply the generalization of uh, the mean value theorem the mean value theorem we simply approximated f of x by a first order function here we are approximating it by uh, mth order polynomial for the first m minus 1 or first m terms you only needed the derivatives at x naught but for the last one you need the derivative not at x naught but again here again theta is a number between 0 and 1 the, you need the last derivative at some point in between x and x naught and you will get the exact function for f of x Okay. This is useful because later on, when we talk about conditions for a function to have a minimum, uh, this approximation will become useful in finding out what the conditions are. If that's yes. maybe this is a little too abstract, we'll do an example and then we'll maybe that will help. Okay, let's do a simple example. Square. Okay. What is f dash of x? It's two x. It's two. Okay. Now, let's say we know that. Let's say we start with the point x equals zero. F of zero. This is our x naught. Well, let me write it like that. Zero. What is f dash of x naught? Zero. Oh, not zero, right? Two. Yes. Okay. Let's say we want to find the value of the function at x equals one. Okay. And we want to use this. That means, so that means my f of 1 will be what? Using this, the idea here. 
f of 0, okay. epsilon here is 1. Okay. Into epsilon? Okay. Huh. Not 0. It will be 0 plus something, right? So we don't know the theta n. Okay, what will this work out to? Okay, this is 0, this is 0. So we are, and this is, what is this? So f of 0 will be 0, 0. No, hold on. I've messed up somewhere. This will always be two. No, that's correct. Yes, this is fine. This is two. Two. Epsilon is one. Get one, right? Let's say we did not use the second derivative. We only use the first derivative, right? And this goes off. We use the same formula. Instead of doing the mth derivative, here it was m was 2. Let's say we only use the first derivative. Then this would change to f dash of 0 plus theta times epsilon into epsilon. Okay. Now tell me what would be theta. So this is 0, but this is not 0 anymore. What is this? f dash, the first derivative of this function, at 0 plus theta times epsilon. The first derivative of this function with respect to x is 2x. So that means it will be 2 times epsilon. Okay. We know the value of f1. What is f1? f1 is 1. Means and epsilon is 1. So, we simply substitute half here. So, the, the Taylor, the, the first order polynomial uh, uh, describing f of x for this function x square is essentially this. If you, if you only have the first derivative, if you have the second derivative, of course, then you have to do this here. Maybe we do one for x cube, but we'll use the first two derivatives and then we'll stop. What is f dash of x? And then we want to express uh, this f of x using the Taylor scale. What is this? Okay. Let's say we know x naught is 1 for us. Okay. So what will be f dash f1? F double dash. Well, we'll leave f double dash as it is. What is f dash 1? Okay. Three. Okay. Now tell me what is the value of f of 2? And what will be the value of theta that we'll need for expressing f of 2? So this will be we're looking at x equals 2.
you have it? Hola, ¿no? Sorry. It's all, yes, you're right. It's one. Oh, yes, you're right. Sorry, I missed that. Yes, it's one plus. Okay, so if you solve this, you will find that there is a value for theta between zero and one that will give you this expression. Okay, this is just to demonstrate that make you comfortable that this is this is in fact okay. okay okay that's the basic stuff i wanted to cover and now yeah, we, move, we move on to this side of minimize Since we are, I mean, our, our main goal is we have a function f of x, we want to minimize this. And we want to find the x star, the value of uh, x that attains uh, this minimum value. Okay? That is the case, and we have to have a clean, defin clear definition of what do we mean by a minimizer of a function. Okay? There are two types of minimizers. One is called a global. Global minimizer, that's local. Okay. Global minimizer, uh, the idea is very simple. So you say something is a global, you say that x star is a global minimizer of the function f of x. Okay. Okay. If f of x is greater than or equal to of x star, okay, for all x belonging to, for all possible real uh, uh, elements from Rn, except for, you take set Rn, you simply remove x star and retain everything else. Okay, that's what the difference means. Difference between two sets means you, you retain everything from here and remove whatever uh, is from the other set and you keep that. If every other point from Rn, if you apply the function f, if it gives you a value greater than what the value of the function at x star, then you say this is a global, x star is a global minimizer. Okay. And you say that x star is a strict global minimizer. When would it be a strict global minimizer? The equality sign disappears. Okay. There is no other, for example, if I say this, this means there is some other value of uh, x which can be equal, but it cannot be greater. Okay. If it's equal, then the other x is also a, is a, is a global minimize. But if there is no other x that achieves the global minimum, then you say that x star is a strict global minimizer. That's that's relatively easy. Definition. The definition for the local for a local minimizer is a little bit more involved. Okay. Local minimizer. And when you say your x is a x some vector x star is a local minimizer, you always have to describe uh, in what, what locality, okay? So, it's a local, x star is a local minimizer in the neighborhood, let's say, okay? And this will be a subset of R, okay? Some small region of Rn, okay? We say x star is a 
local minimizer in this neighborhood, okay, for example, if you're talking about R2, global minimizer would means if you have a strict, let's say if we say this is a strict global minimizer, that means for all values of uh, all points from R2, the function is always higher than the value value the function attains at this point. If I mean if you think of the function, if you think of this as the f of x axis, then the value of the functions are all greater than the value of the function that the value of the function attains at this point. But if you're talking about a local minimizer, let's say this is a local minimizer, then we say, well, this is a local minimizer. That means the value of the functions within this neighborhood are all greater than the value that the function attains at this uh, point x star. Okay, we make no gap. We no make no statements about some anything outside this. Within this locality, this is the value of x star, where the va value of the function is the lowest. F of x star is the lowest. Okay, so that's the idea. So that means you say that x star is a local minimizer if for some epsilon. f of x is greater than or equal to x star when x minus x star is less than epsilon. Okay, so if you choose a small region around, so what this means is you, let's say you have your x star and you say that this is a local minimizer. So this is a local minimizer if you choose a small region around this, okay? And I define that region by this statement. Uh, all points x whose distance from x star is less than epsilon. So that means I'm saying I'm considering a radius, a ball of radius epsilon, okay? If this is the true norm, then I'm really talking about a circle, okay? Within this region, okay, every other f of x has a value that is greater than or equal to x star, then you say this is the local minimizer. Okay. And if then you say this is okay. okay we'll, we'll look at a couple of examples. So you had a function like this. Okay. What would this point correspond to? This is f of x. This is x. We are only talking about um, function from r to r because it's easier to visualize. What is this point? This would be a well, assuming that the this curve is always uh, higher than these two points beyond these two values of x. This would be a global minimizer. What about this point? Local. This will be a okay. What about these? Here, let's say it's really flat. That means all these points are the same value. What about this point? Is it a local minimizer? Local minimizer, at least say in this neighborhood. Well, here, as I said before, if you're talking about local minimizer, you have to specify the neighborhood. But it looks like, at least if you choose this as your neighborhood, it is a local minimizer. You can expand it out a little, maybe. Well, you can actually go till here, here and say this is a local minimizer for this, but still, it's, you get the idea. What about this? Let's say we are considering this neighbor. This would be a local minimizer. What about this? That would also be a local minimizer because it has the same value as this, right? 
Now the difference is here, these two are not strict local minimizers because here, if you say x, let's say I call this x star 1. Okay, I call this x star 2. If I consider just x star 1, right? Here, there is another x star 2 for which the equality sign holds. Okay, that's why these two are not strict local minimizers. Whereas this one here is a strict local minimizer because there is no other point in this neighborhood which attains the value that this attains. Okay. In fact, if you had a function like this, okay, and you say this is the neighborhood I'm considering, and let's say all of these had the same value, okay, then all of these would be local minimizers in this neighborhood, but they would not be strict minimizers. But if, you, if your neighborhood was this, then you say this is a strict local minimizer for this neighborhood. Okay, so that's the definition of, uh, or that's the characteristics of the points that we are looking for when we say we are trying to minimize a function. And if you're talking about continuous functions f of x, okay. if you're talking about continuous functions f of x, and let's say for now, we're dealing with this. There are some, if f of x is continuous, there are some conditions that uh, that f of x needs to satisfy uh, at any local minimizer. Okay. I'll simply state those for now. Uh, the first one uh, is called the first order necessary condition. I'll not write the whole thing down. Okay. Necessary condition. Okay. So if you have a function, uh, f of x from r n to r and let's say this is this is a differentiable function at least twice at least twice differentiable function that means the gradient and the hessian exist then if you say this point x star is a local mini minimizer then the gradient of this function at x star this is okay. the gradient has to go to zero okay any point that is a local minimizer this condition has to be satisfied if it's not satisfied then it's it's not local minimizer again this only holds for unconstrained optimization if you have a constrained optimization problem the condition is slightly different Okay, but condition is slightly different depending on whether you are at the boundary of the constraint or inside uh, the bound. Okay, and the but this is not enough. This does this only means that the function is uh, that the function does not change uh, uh, very much around the neighborhood. But this is satisfied, for example, uh, we know that in if you're talking about a function from R to R, what is the corresponding condition? First order uh, necessary condition. This has to be zero, okay? But that's not sufficient. I mean, this is necessary, but it's not sufficient, okay? Because this is satisfied by both by minimizer, by minima, maxima, or a saddle point, or what is it called? Uh, saddle. Well, I don't know if it's called saddle point in, or for example, if you have x cube, x cube, the derivative of x cube at x equals 0 is 0, but it's neither a maxima nor a minima. Okay, it, it looks like this the derivative is 0. Okay. So, this is necessary, but it does not mean that the point that you're dealing with is a minima. Okay. The condition that tells you that it's a minima, again, x star is a local minima, if the Hessian of this function at x star is positive semi-definite. Okay. 
What does it mean? No, what is the definition for? Ah, yeah, okay. Okay, when is the matrix A positive definite? Well, if it's positive definite, it's greater than zero. Be zero? Yes. Okay, all right. Everybody remembers this. That's good. Okay. Then, if you take any vector D, this is always there is an equal zero. Provided D is not zero. Okay. So, if this is satisfied, then that point uh, uh, is, uh, if this is satisfied, then that is, that is the local minimum. Okay. And, okay. but, if this is but if your SN is is positive definite okay, then that's sufficient as, as long as you know that this is zero and this is uh, positive your SN is positive definite then that point is will be a local minimum so extra Okay. Right. See, one thing I, I did not say um, earlier, but we'll come to that later. Okay. I mean, the corresponding conditions for, if you're talking about functions from R, R is df by dx is zero and so if there is any point at which the derivative is zero and the second derivative is positive, then you see, then that point would be a local minimum. Okay. Again, let's do an uh, example. Square. Where is the, well, there is a global minima here. Where is the minima in this function? Is there a minima in this function? First derivative is 2x, second derivative is 2, second derivative is always positive. 2x is 0 when x is 0. So at x equals 0, the function is in fact is a minimum, has a minimum. Okay. What about this? What is the first derivative? But where is the potential minimum of this function? The potential minimum is when the first derivative is 0. Okay, where is it? Okay, x equal to 0 is a potential minimum. Is that a minimum? What is the second derivative? Zero. Okay. All right. Let's look at another one. What is the graph of this looking? Well, maybe first we'll find out what is the first order condition? Where is the potential minimum? It's at zero. What about the second derivative? It's also zero. Let's look at the graphs of both of these. Okay. What is the graph of this? Well, let's make it let's make it x cube, make it easy. What does it look like? X power 4, maybe that's a little easier. Like this? Is that correct? X power 4. No, is that correct? Yeah, it, this is okay. This is X power 4. What about X cube? 
here. Okay. Be like this. They will meet at x equals one. Now, in both these cases, the second derivative is zero, but clearly one of them has a minimum and the other does not. Okay. This does not have a minimum because there is no lower uh, lowest value for this function. Whereas for x power four, there is a lowest value zero. Everything else is positive. Okay, so clearly, again, these are not. Uh, these conditions are violated by some functions which still have a minimum and this is not satisfied. Okay. See, in this case, uh, you will have to resort to uh, the Taylor series for x power 4 next cube uh, to argue why f equals f of x equals x cube does not have a minimum whereas x f f of x equals x power 4 has a minimum okay i'll quickly do uh, go through the argument for x power 4 even think about x cube and see why it's not satisfied see the taylor series expansion for this is simply okay say x naught equals 0, what will be the corresponding Taylor series expansion for f of x? f of x naught, f of f dash of x naught into, uh, let's say x naught is 0, right? So, yeah, it's simply this, f of 0, f dash of 0 into x, f double dash of 0 into x square, F x cube and x power 4. All of these are 0. So the only thing that you have is this. See, from the definition of a minimum, if x star is the minimum of a function, right, then every other possible value of x that you choose that is different from x star should have a function value f of x that is always greater than the value of the function at f of x star. Okay? x star is 0. That means f of 0 should be less than every other f of x where x not equals 0. Right, that's the definition of a strict. That is the definition of a strict minimum. If zero is the minimum of this function, then every other point has a value greater than f of zero. Okay. Now, if you look at this function, right? If the fourth derivative of this function is positive, okay. This term here is always positive. And if this term is positive, that means my f of x's are all positive values. Okay. And f of 0 is 0. That means all possible values of f of x are greater than 0. Okay. That is why this function has a minimum at x equals 0. The same argument will not apply for x cube, because this would be refactorial, this is the third x cube. Because this term is not guaranteed to be positive always. Right? If you choose positive values of x, and if this is positive, then f of x, uh, values of f of x are greater than f of 0. But if you choose negative values of x, then this is a negative quantity. That means it's got a value lower than 0. That means the condition, this is not satisfied by all x's. Okay, that's why that one does not have a, I mean, x cubed does not have a minimum at x equals 0. Okay. Is what? It's three factorial. It will be six, no? Third derivative. What is the third derivative? First derivative is three x square, six x, six. It's positive. So what is the argument? So you're saying it should be. Yes, okay. 
is 1 by 3 factorial. This is positive. Okay, this is in fact 6. In fact, these two will cancel. It's simply x cube. Okay. You're telling me that f of 0 is, is a minimum. Okay, if f of 0 is a minimum, then every other possible values of x should have value f of x that is greater than f of 0. Okay, if you put positive values of x here, it, this is satisfied. What if I put negative values of x? It's not satisfied. That means this cannot be a minimum. <laughs> See, okay, so I mean, we can find, for example, if you have a function f of x and if it's got a relatively simple expression, then you can analytically find out where the minimum is uh, uh, or where the first derivative goes to zero and check if the second derivative is zero. Or maybe if this second derivative is not greater than zero but equal to zero, then you look at the higher derivatives and then maybe you can figure out whether or not. A uh, particular point is a is a minimum, but the moment the expression for f of x is slightly more complicated, an analytical solution becomes impossible. Okay, so the approach that is usually taken, uh, we have this function f of x. Okay, that is too complex for uh, any analytical solution. Uh, so then you you resort to uh, an iterative method. Iterative. For minimizing minimizing f of x, okay. In the iterative approach, it takes a very simple is is relatively simple, at least an idea, right? You start with some initial guess for what you think what you think is a minimum for the function. Let's say we call that x zero, okay. And then at x zero, you You find let's, the derivative of the function, okay, and you find if it's equal to zero. Okay, if you're taking a numerical approach, you can. You I mean this will never be equal to zero, okay, unless for very special cases. Okay, it means you essentially look for f dash of x not ultimately close to zero. Okay, if it's not close to zero, that means you're not at a minimum. Then you simply move to another nearby point using some rule okay you use gh uh, some rule okay you look at the value of the function or the derivative of the function at x naught so you essentially look at the local be behavior of the function function at x naught and then based on that you simply shift your x naught to a new new value okay and you and then you check this again and then you continue it okay so the so what you would do in an iterative method is simply this you continuously keep searching uh, for new values of x that satisfy this condition that you're looking for so Things you might uh, check would be this, and if this is then zero. Okay, so that's the general approach you take to do this numerically. Okay, and see there are many different ways to do this. One of the most popular approaches is called. Newton's method. Okay. The idea here, uh, the Newton's method, uh, again relies on uh, this idea of the Taylor series that we Taylor uh, theorem that we talked about, where we said a function f of x can be approximated by uh, m order polynomial. Okay. So here we approximate the function f of x. By a quadratic polynomial, by a quadratic function, second order polynomial.
Okay. So you have f of x. So you let's say you you you're currently at some guess for your uh, for the value of x that minimizes this function f of x x k. Let's say you at this point x k, you know the value of the function. Okay. You know its derivative. And let's also assume that you know its second derivative. Okay. I'll, I'll simply write this as fk, f dash k, so that I don't have to repeat xk again and again. Okay. Let's say at some point, xk, you know the value of the function, the value the function attains, the first derivative and the second derivative. And let's say the stopping condition uh, that the point is, let's say this condition is not satisfied, the, the, the gradient is not zero or the derivative is not zero, that means you're not at a minimum. So what you do is, because you know these three, you now approximate f of x by a quadratic function q of x, okay, such that this quadratic function satisfies these constraints. Q of xk equals f of xk or fk. Q dash at xk is f dash of k and q double dash of k. Okay, so you find a function such that it approximates f of x and it satisfies this criteria. Both of them have the same value at xk. Both of them have the same first derivative and second derivative at xk. Okay. So if you do that, what you will get, so q of x will have this form. Will be q of xk plus q dash, oh no, sorry will be f dash of okay. the value of the function f at xk, the first derivative multiplied by x plus half, the second derivative of the function at xk multiplied by x square. This is essentially the approximation of f of x by a quadratic function. This is nothing but the first three terms of the uh, Taylor series. We've simply ignored the other ones uh, because we want to approximate it by a quadratic function. Okay. Once you have this quadratic function, so you, let's say you, you had your function like this, and this was your xk, this is your f of x. Maybe I'll, I'll remove this. I'll keep the plot here. So, so it's like this. Over here. This is your xk. So you know the value of the function fk dash k. And now you found a quadratic function q of x that approximates this function here. And maybe that looks like this. The quadratic function maybe looks like this at this point. That's q of x. Okay. Now all you do, okay, you want you want to minimize f of x, but your best your best quadratic approximation for your f of x is q of x. So you say I'm going to minimize q of x. Okay. What is the where is the minimum of this function? How do you find the minimum of this function? Yes, okay, tell me, what will it be? Where will it be? Here, I did one mistake here. This is not x. This is x minus xk. Okay, because we are talking about approximating f at uh, the point xk. So this will be x minus. So. Now, the, if it's a, if, this function as a minimum, then 
should be equal to zero. And if you do that, what will you get? Maybe you can you can uh, find out and tell me, and then we'll derive. It's basically the derivative of this function with respect to x. Yeah, okay, tell me what it is. X, see, xk is, so fk, f dash of k, f double dash of k, they are all fixed numbers. xk is also a fixed number because that's where we are right now. And we are trying to approximate our f of x by this quadratic function. So if you take the derivative of this with respect to x, what do you get? Yep. Yep. Yeah, okay. So. No, 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 sorry, not x minus f, x k, right? You're differentiating with respect to x, no? And then derivative of this, what is that? Yes, but there is a half. What is the solution for x now? Because the other three terms we know. We know f dash, we know f double dash, and we know xk. In terms of x. Sorry? F dash of not Here. This is x minus xk, no? into x minus xk, no? So that's, let's say f dash is 5. It's 5 minus x minus xk. xk is a constant. So derivative of this with respect to x is simply 5. No, no. Yes, you're right. fk is a function of x. But for a fixed value of xk, for example, yes, you're right. If I have x square, the first derivative of this is 2x. It's a function of x. But at x equals 3, the first derivative has a fixed value, 6. So xk, see x, xk is not a variable. See, we've arrived at xk. Now, right for now, at the kth iteration, for us, xk is a fixed value. xk is a number. And all we're doing by getting the quadratic approximation is we're trying to get an approximate approximation of f of x around this point xk. And we're trying to minimize that instead of minimizing the original function because the original function is too complicated. What do you get? So you will get something like this. Okay, you can verify that. Okay, that means the point X that we will get there will be this point. Here, see again, I've made, I've drawn this uh, f of x in such a way, and I've chosen x of k in such a way that uh, the second, the second derivative at this point is positive. That's why you get a parabola like this. If I had drawn my f of x like this, right, and if I had chosen this as my x k, my second derivative would be negative here. I might, have, I would have gotten a parabola like this for q of x. For now, let's let's assume that f double dash of k is, is positive. Okay. Now, if you simply substitute for the numbers here, you'll find some x that minimizes this q of x, and at this point, okay. And all you do now is you say, okay, because q is is an approximation of my f of x, this x you'll simply treat this x that you obtain by solving this as the next possible as the, as the next point in your in your search searching process in your searching process okay so now this will simply become and then you do the same thing again so now this is gone this out 
and then now you now compute fk plus one fk and you do the same thing you now the parabola that you fit might be slightly different might be like this okay and you go through the same thing again and then you'll get this point now this will be your and you simply come continue this process okay until you reach a point where your f dash of x is very much close to zero if f dash of k is very much close to zero then this term is very small you are iterations now I mean your consecutive estimates for uh, uh, x will be all very close to each other once you reach that once you find that that this difference is less than let's say 0 0.0 10 power minus 5 then you say i'm done that's the minimum okay that's the idea and that's the newton's method i just show you a couple of examples one where uh, it works well and one where it newton's method fails terribly yes here all iterative methods will only give you a local minimum uh, you there is no they will not, there is no guarantee that you will get a global minimum you will get a global minimum only if you are dealing with what are called convex functions functions that uh, have only one minimum okay so this is uh, so see the function that the blue line is your f of x and that's some complicated function like okay that's what we're trying to minimize okay this green dot is my initial guess x naught in that iteration process you you choose some random number okay and then at this point uh, x naught is minus 4 i compute f of x naught f dash of x naught f double dash of x naught and then the fit of this q of x the approximation for f of x the quadratic approximation of f of x around the green point is that red line and if you minimize that find the minima of that red curve that's yours that that's the square red dot here okay that's my new that's my x1 which is minus 2.4 something uh, if i the next thing i'll lose that now i'll use the red dot as my current dot and do the same procedure again so if i do well i've skipped two steps now i have another one and then if i if i continuously keep doing it We just run through it, okay? And then after a particular point, that is the that's the local minimum. It it arrives there. Now there are a few points where you found where it where you saw that it did something very strange. Okay. Let me reset. Okay. Now you run this through it again. You reach, and this is essentially this is the this is the plot of x k versus k. Okay, this green uh, graph that you see there. there you see what happened uh, like i showed you there all the other q of x is where the function that had a minimum okay whereas this one looks like it's inverted parabola okay that's because your second derivative is negative now so there is so when the second derivative is negative of course what will happen is you will get pushed in the opposite direction see see one way to think about uh, the newton's method where did i keep it yeah, here is this see or here let's say you're at a point x okay and you know the derivative of this function at this point x okay in what direction do you have to move for you to minimize uh or find the value of x a new value of x such that the value of the function in the, at the new value is lower than your current value Let's, let's call it fk. Put it xk. The value of the function is xk, f of xk. Should I increase or decrease my xk for me to lower the value of f? Well, that depends on the derivative of the function. If the function has a positive first derivative, then I have to decrease xk. If it has a negative uh, first derivative, then I have to increase fk. Right? That means if I simply move in the direction opposite to my first derivative 
then I'm likely to reduce my F. So let's say I move by a small amount. Okay, but this negative sign is important. Okay, and this alpha is a positive number. If F dash is positive, then I reduce the value of, uh, I reduce this value. If F dash is positive, then I increase this value. Okay, that's the idea. Now, look at this. This alpha is, is you decide how much you want to move in the direction of your first derivative, right? The, this, this, sorry, this here plays the role of your alpha. This tells you how much you believe your first derivative, okay? But you always move in the opposite direction of your derivative. As long as this is a positive number, you're okay. There, because now the second derivative is negative, instead of moving, even though the first derivative is uh, negative, that means you, you can continue to increase the value. Of, so if I increase the value of x3, then I'm likely to get a lower value. If I only consider the first derivative, but the second derivative is negative, that's why. So my previous point was this, okay? Uh, and then from here, I, I came here. This is my uh, current point. Now, if I follow the Newton's procedure, it says now the new point is here. That's because your second derivative at this point was negative. But if I continue from that point, and if I miss that point where the second derivative is negative, then I'm okay. Then I, then I get through and I get to the... Uh, then. So these are all places where it can fail. Okay. I'll show you another function where the function looks very uh, benign. And in fact, it is. But then the behavior is extremely bad. This is simply 1 minus e power minus x square. Okay. But the unfortunate thing is the second derivative of this function at almost all points except for very uh, small region here is all negative. So if you start anywhere outside, you'll simply move, continuously move away from the minimum. So if I start from another point, I simply move away. I don't come closer. You have to be lucky. Ah, if I start close enough, now you see the, parab the quadratic approximation is actually a, a parabola that has a minimum. Then you're okay. Then you reach the global, uh, the local minimum. So the Newton's method works as far as long as you are fairly close to your local local minimum. But if you're a little too far away, uh, then you are not always guaranteed that you will find it. And this is a good example. And here, see, this is a very simple function. It does not have any uh, strange looking uh, behavior. Okay. But this, even though this is fairly simple, uh, Newton's method fails here. Okay. Okay. So we'll stop here uh, for today and then we'll take it up. Uh, some next class.